CEO Ron Wickler from Creating the Difference. Please, if you haven't read the blog that kind of goes into detail of what we did for this test, spend a few minutes and go through that blog and just kind of see what we did. And then watch this video and learn a lot more details about the process that we went through uh, to be able to show you the reaction difference. We learned a whole lot from doing this test, hard purple hammer versus soft purple hammer. Uh, we learned a lot about what the advantages is, uh, are of having a softer purple hammer. And remember, this bowling ball that we're showing you is not USB-C legal um, and is not USB-C approved because we have chemically altered the hardness of the bowling ball and that is not allowed. CEO Ronald Hickler from Creating the Difference. I have a very special guest here with me today. His name is David Henson. David Henson worked at Ebonite International for more than 50 years. He was responsible for a lot of things at Ebonite International, but the thing that we're most interested in here today is his ability to check bowling balls for hardness. He also did all kinds of quality checks while he was there, but we specifically asked him to come in and check some bowling balls for us as we wanted to kind of find out and learn more about hardness and leverage the power of his information regarding hardness, roundness, and anything else related to the quality specs of bowling balls. David, thank you for joining us here. I'm excited to be able to find out some information about hardness and just some of the history that uh, you're gonna be able to bring to us, knowing that you've been through uh, rubber bowling balls, urethane bowling balls, polyester bowling balls, reactive bowling balls, and now it's kind of funny, uh, we're actually going back and checking a lot of bowling balls, but the ones that are kind of interesting in the bowling community right now are the urethane bowling balls, which used to be popular in the 80s and now have kind of come back. So thank you for coming. And with that being said, we're gonna get right to it. So now what we're looking at is the durometer. The durometer is a device that's used to check the hardness of the bowling ball. And this one's actually very similar to the one that USB-C uses. Now what you're gonna watch is you're gonna watch David as he goes through the process of checking the bowling ball in 10 spots. Now, David's been doing this, like you said, for about 50 years. So he's very, very meticulous about how he does it and where he does it. In addition to what you're seeing here, one of the notes that's that needs to be made is that the durometer that we're using is much different than what you would typically find if you were to go buy one on Amazon. You see that, that uh, silver weight at the top? Well, that silver weight is what's actually applying the pressure to the bowling ball. So it's very consistent and repeatable as opposed to manually trying to press on the ball to be able to get a durometer reading. Now, David's taking 10 readings on a bowling ball, which is what the uh, USB-C um, standard operating procedure requests. So that's what we did. And we wanted him just to do a bunch of different bowling balls and just kind of see the variation um, that we were gonna have uh, in the bowling balls and in the specs. Now, like I said, we made sure the bowling balls, in addition to that, were at um, within the USB-C a temperature range too, that ranges between 70 and 77 degrees. So we wanted to make sure each of the bowling balls was uh, there as well so that we didn't have, you know, we could eliminate as much variation as possible. Now, is this is this exactly uh, the same environment that USB-C uses? No, USB-C is in Texas and we're in Tennessee, but it's as close as we could get. So we thought it was important to be able to show you guys some of what we were doing to be able to uh, collect as much data as possible and do it in a manner um, that was, you know, replicative of what USB-C does um, and then use somebody who is completely removed from the situation to be able to actually check the balls. And you can see, not only did we check um, bowling balls that were drilled, but we checked bowling balls that were undrilled as well, with the whole point here being to try to get um, as much data as humanly possible to be able to produce some good, repeatable results. We also did a ramp test, as you can see here. Now, what we're doing here is kind of unique. If you look on the lane, you can see that piece of paper, and that piece of paper is actually a, a, basically a carbon sheet of paper that allows us to measure the footprint um, of the bowling ball. So what we're doing here is we've got a bowling ball uh, on a ramp from a set height, and really what we're trying to capture here is the footprint of that bowling ball. So you can watch us kind of change out the piece of paper. You can watch us kind of set the bowling ball up and roll it down the ramp. And the whole point here, like I said, is just for us to see, you know what, does the softer bowling ball leave a bigger imprint um, on the sheet of paper? Or does the harder bowling ball leave a smaller imprint? Or does any of that even matter? So once again, I mean, we're just trying to show you what we did here. Um, not to say that this is the only way to do it, um, but this was the way that we thought would be best a representative um, to be able to find out if in fact there is a correlation between the bowling ball softness and uh, the, the footprint left behind on the bowling ball. So you can take a peek at that and just kind of see what we did there. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple process. Nothing too fancy there uh, to be shown, but you can at least see what we did. 
Now for this last test, we wanted to try something that was also kind of unique. We wanted to actually roll a bowling ball down the lane. And this is a flat pattern. This is actually the red square pattern that we're using. And we're, what we're trying to do here is we're capturing some speed data. So we're using Specto. We've got Specto and we're able to capture some speed data or speed loss data, right? That's kind of what we're looking for here. Now you say, well, what about the pin placement and the CG placement and mass buys, all that kind of things? What we did was we specifically oriented the balls. You can look when you watch the ball go down the lane uh, when it's set up. The pin is at 12 o'clock, the CG is at six o'clock. And what this basically does is this neutralizes uh, the core position, right? The ball is in a rolling position and uh, not sliding. So that's good and bad. It's good because it's very easy to repeat. Um, it's bad because that's not really how a bowling ball rolls down the lane. As a bowling ball goes down the lane, there's actually some translational uh, rotation going on um, as well as uh, the bowling ball is sliding. Whereas in this case, the bowling ball is directly going into rolling. Uh, but it is good for us from a repeatability standpoint just to kind of understand um, if there is a speed loss change, which kind of allows us to take into consideration that footprint. It also allows us to take into consideration um, you know, if the softness or hardness of a bowling ball really, really matters here. So that's kind of what we're just showing you, uh, the process that we kind of went through, to just to kind of understand more about, you know, does this matter or does it not matter? We didn't know, we wanted to find out, and that's why we're showing it to you and showing you exactly kind of what we did to be able to come up uh, with some of the data that we are going to show you. Now, the last test that we did was actually bowling. And this was kind of where the aha moment kind of happened, where we really began to understand the benefit of hardness. So remember, we're bowling on a completely flat pattern. So if I throw it to the left, that ball's not supposed to recover at all. If I throw it to the right, it's supposed to hook too much because the pattern is completely flat. But what's interesting is, is when the bowling ball is hard, you don't see the recovery that you see when the ball is soft. You also don't have any room for error. So when you're watching me throw these shots, you know, if, if I'm throwing the hard bowling ball, I'm not being able to get any sort of miss error, no sort of room for error, no sort, if I throw it a little harder, it just over pushes, but that kind of all smooths out once you start throwing the softer ball. And that is kind of what led us to begin to understand the value of the softer ball. So look at it this way. The pattern is a flat pattern and it's cliff, meaning there's oil to a certain spot and then it shuts off and that's the end of it. But what happens is, when you're throwing your ball down the lane on that kind of pattern, if you're throwing the ball and you throw it a little harder, it's gonna over push and that's just what happens. But if you have a softer bowling ball, the beautiful thing about that is you can actually watch the ball slow down and our data would indicate that the softer bowling balls do slow down. In fact, it was a mile an hour slower uh, typically than from the harder bowling ball. Well, that's slowing down allows the bowling ball to begin to generate friction a little bit earlier. If it generates friction a little bit earlier, you're going to be able to get more potential control out of the pattern. So everybody kind of focuses on the hook and they say, well, man, you know, the softer ball hooks more. But the truth of the matter is we could get reactive balls that could hook just as much as the purple hammer that's soft, but it's how it hooks that matters. So with the urethane ball being soft, as that ball is going down the lane, it is slowing down faster than typical. And, it's, and because it's slowing down faster and it's softer with that wider footprint, it can actually begin to generate friction earlier, which makes the pattern play like it's tapered. It's not tapered, but it plays like it's tapered. And you say, well, why does that matter? Well, on a house shot, the lane pattern tends to be tapered, meaning that there's more oil in the front. And as you go down the lane, there begins to, the, the volume of the oil begins to get less and less and less, and that's tapering the pattern. What that does is that creates miss room for when you the bowler. It allows you to be able to miss and still be able to get back to the pocket. Well, on a PBA pattern, on a sport pattern, on a flat pattern, you don't have that. And that's why that's one reason that they're so much harder. But as you're watching me throw these shots, you can see I can miss and the ball recovers. That's because we are taking a pattern that is flat and making it play like it's not flat. And that is very, very advantageous. Now, some of the other differences are, you know, uh, my rev rate is only 350 RPMs. Most pros are 500 RPMs or higher. So they're gonna be able to get this effect out of bowling balls that are harder than the 64.9 durometer bowling ball that I threw. So it would make sense that a pro bowling on a flat pattern would be able to see more of this, 
this tapering effect from the bowling ball and be able to take advantage of it, right? So that makes a lot of sense as well. And then you add into the fact that bowling ball, specifically the purple hammer, we've got a lot of data that shows that, that ball actually gets softer. That ball is approaching this 64.9. So imagine what happens if you got a purple hammer and it was 73 or 72 to start, but then as you're using it, it goes down to 65 or 64 or even lower. Well, that means this bowling ball is actually getting better over time, right? And that's the beautiful thing about this particular product is that it actually gets better over time. Now, I believe that that's probably part of the reason why it's been so popular and so generally accepted as a unique piece in the market, especially at the professional level. I also think that at the amateur level and people that like myself that bowl mostly house shots, there isn't an advantage like that because the taper's already built into the pattern. So you look at this house shot graph here, you can see there's already a taper built into the pattern. So you don't need to have the extra taper from the soft purple hammer to be able to take advantage of it. And as a matter of fact, a reactive ball will be better for you on this pattern because you'll be able to take care, you'll be able to take advantage of the side to side friction that's already built into the pattern as well. That's not on a PBA sport or a flat pattern. So that's why a lot of times the league bowler does not need to be able to get a bowling ball uh, like a purple hammer to, to be able to score well. They can do just fine with the Tanner reactive ball, but that's also why the pros who are at higher rev rate, they're bowling on flatter patterns, they can take advantage of this uh, unique situation with the purple hammer. So now hopefully you've got some more information and a little better understanding of what makes the purple hammer ball special. You know, like I said in the blog, you know, USBC and the PBA are making changes to the rules as they get information. I think the changes that they are making are for the betterment of the sport. They're trying to keep the integrity of the sport um, in the game. And I think you're gonna see more changes um, as this thing, as the situation continues to evolve because they're getting more information. So I would just ask that, you know, if you like this video, you know, uh, share it with your friends, um, try to keep, keep everything positive, right? As best we can. Obviously the time is very, very uh, rough right now in the bowling community, but this is an opportunity uh, for everybody to learn. And this isn't supposed to be like the end all be all. This is meant to be an illustration. This is meant to be a demonstration because when we went to go do some searching for this topic and information, we just couldn't find any. So we're like, well, why don't we spend some money and create some information? And then why don't we just share it with everybody? Um, it's, it's feel free to critique it, feel free to ask questions. Um, you know, we, we, we definitely will try to answer as many questions as we can. We don't have all the answers. We're not tied to any entity. We're not tied to any of the ball companies. We're not tied to USBC. We are our own company. And as a result of that, we can pr produce product like this for you to be able to watch and enjoy and hopefully uh, share and learn from it. So I just wanted to say thank you for uh, uh, spending some time and watching the video. Uh, thank you to Mikey and Neil and, and, and David and all the people tied to help us to kind of create this piece. Hope you found some value from it. If you did, share it with your friends and Hopefully let's get back to bowling and uh, having uh, the best possible season that we can with the situation that we're in. And I appreciate you guys spending some time and watching the video. With that being said, I'm out of here. CEO, Ronald Cliff from Create a Difference. Talk to you soon.